Okay, so um, I thought I'd show you guys here uh, your assignment that's coming up, your international, or not your international, but well, you can, it's kind of international if you choose to do it that way. So your project, your final project here is due this Friday. So, under assignments, if you guys click that, you can get to this little gizmo here. Let me try to blow it up so you can get a little bit be able to see it. There we go. So, economic freedom, purpose to review, get a better standing of economic freedom or Bitcoin, your choice. So pick a country for the, for, if you do the economic freedom, you know, pick some country and write about the five economic freedom areas and the score for that country. Discuss why you think it has that ranking. Um, an introduction paragraph for each should do it. So kind of the five areas that we've worked through. Uh, if you do Bitcoin, research what Bitcoin is in general, and then there's lots of different kind of specific areas of Bitcoin, like how will Bitcoin um, impact exchange rates? How will Bitcoin impact inflation? Something like that. I have a question now. What is the makeup homework? The makeup homework, uh, yeah. It's, uh, um, so basically, I always accept it up till the to the bitter end, but the test is Monday. So let's just say Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday night for any makeup homework. You can make up stuff at 20% penalty. Or if you have a, a test to make up, you need to email me. Everybody gets one freebie if you haven't used it already. Uh, just email me and I will unlock the test and that will allow you to improve a grade. So if you've got a, you know, 20% on a, on a score or something, you want to try to improve it, uh, you can do that. Or if you just missed a, a score, um, if you missed uh, some other ones, it's a 20% penalty. So make sure you email me on ones you want to have open for a retry for your freebie. Okay, any other questions there? So regardless of the thing you pick, you're going to have a written portion, and then you're going to do either sidewalk chalk or a 60-second video presentation of what your thing is. And you need to upload that to Blackboard. So you can do either one. So the sidewalk chalk, basically out to the courtyard here, um, if you get some chalk, you can just kind of do an advertisement, basically, uh, and then take a picture of it, and you'll upload the thing that you did on whatever your subtopic is. So questions there? Let me, uh, those of you who want to do the economic freedom, freetheworld.com, I think we have the link in a variety of places, but it's the Fraser Institute, freetheworld.com, this is the one we've been using. And so you can pick different countries like we did, and it shows the areas. The handout that I gave, if you guys missed the day, we, we handed them out for a couple different days. Make sure you come up after class. And I think I got buried in here somewhere. But it was the sheet that had the all the countries listed, the black and white sheet. And that has that is taken right out of this book. And it has all of the five areas that you would need to write about. So it was the you know, size of government. So each one of the areas, maybe if you guys have this still, you, well, let me just throw it up on the doc canvas. Just so that you got it handy. Because I think that'd be pretty easy. You're just going to say what the score is. And so I got the. Size of government is area number one, and then there's a description. That's the one that has the government spending and whatnot as a fraction of uh, total GDP. Number two is legal system. Number three is sound money uh, for inflation. Freedom to trade internationally. Are there trade barriers and that sort of thing? And then finally, regulation. Do they have a minimum wage, that sort of thing? So that's all on your sheet. So if you didn't have that sheet, you can come up after class and grab that. It's also online. It's all on the it's all on the website. 
Um, on here, the, let's see, data set, the research publications and commentaries. <laughs> so this, uh, that's the one of the states. Uh, you guys could do that too if you wanted to do economic freedom. I think probably sticking to the country level is probably better, but here is this publication as a PDF. So the front, the front pages, I literally photocopied the few pages that we have on this is right out of this. So you have access to all of the content there uh, online. All right, any questions? This is kind of a cool one too. I don't have time to show it today, but I mentioned it multiple times, gender, uh, gender equality, gender disparity around, around countries, that's related to economic freedom. So you can do, you can do your report on that maybe on, on a country that doesn't have a lot of uh, gender equality. So this short video would be kind of a, a cool link to learn more about that. So much content, so little time. All right, any questions? <laughs> Got an idea of what you need to do? <laughs> All righty. So let's see. Um, what's next here? Let's kick off with a video here. I told you we had part two of the of the battle versus of Hayek versus Keynes. So Keynes was the big government guy, let's use government, or small government guy? Keynes was the big government guy, so let's use government policy, uh, increase, you know, change taxes, change government spending, some of what we did with the debate last night. Hayek, on the other hand, said, government, you don't have enough information to make good decisions. Let's give the power to people, right? Let's utilize the knowledge in people's head through the market system and keep government relatively small with the three functions. What are the three functions of government? Protective, productive, redistributive. So Hayek would be big on the, which one would, which one would Hayek be big on? The protective, the productive, or the redistributive? Protected, right? Protect individual property rights and let's allow people to do their thing. All right, so here is the, <laughs> Part two of another conference. I'm watching you. Or Kings, well, it's, it, it's such an honor. Indeed, sir. Please just go, just go right on through. Well, well, identification, please. Thank you. 
guest today, since we're talking about fiscal policy, a couple special guests. So uh, Dave Owen uh, was a former student just a few years ago here at Ottawa. So, and he's a former Lieutenant Governor of Kansas, and he has the Owen Leadership Institute here at ODU. And he brought along a friend today, so I thought, uh, I'll let you do the introduction yeah. for your friend. And yeah, well, I, I, we're glad to be here. I, I might just say too that if, if you haven't heard of the Dave Sheelan Leadership Institute, you ought to check it out. One of the cool things it's doing is taking a group of students to Israel in May. And uh, some of you may have heard about that, but there's probably 15 or 20 kids from here are going with us. Is anybody going there that's in here? Jasmine, you're going? Cool. All right. Where is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. How are you? Good. Good. Well, this is Dave Lindstrom. Dave uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, he is running for the United States Senate to take Pat Roberts' place, who retired this year. And um, Dave played for the Kansas City Chiefs for eight years uh, oh. back in the day. And uh, so he's pretty excited about what happened here a few weeks ago. So why don't you tell them a little bit about it? You got any cheese fans here? <laughs> <laughs> Who's not a cheese fan? <laughs> we got you some people from out of state. You guys from out of town? From Baltimore. You're a Ravens fan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where are you guys from? I'm from Kansas. Oh. Step <laughs> outside here. <laughs> uh, Dave and where are you from? Uh, I mean, where are you from? Uh, from Dallas. You're a Cowboys fan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, does anyone here know that the Kansas City Chiefs started in Dallas? They were there in Dallas before the Cowboys. They used to be called, did yes. you know what the team's name was? Texans. The Dallas Texans. Yeah, they were the Texans before before the current Texans. Uh, my name is Dave Lindstrom. I'm originally from Massachusetts. And uh, we just bumped into each other uh, a while ago. We heard you talking about fiscal responsibility. One of the reasons that I'm running for the United States Senate it's not because I want to be a, a U.S. Senator, not because I'm trying to uh, get famous, or not because I'm trying to become wealthy, uh, and a lot of people do that in politics in this country, but because um, a, a businessman, uh, when I retired from the Chiefs, I owned and operated my own Burger King restaurants. I had a chain of restaurants for 25 years, sold those restaurants uh, back about 10 years ago, and uh, I wasn't successful in, in business there by spending more than I took in. And uh, um, does anyone here have their own business? Anyone grow up in a family that had a business? Yeah, uh, with, with those businesses, uh, I hope they were successful. And uh, if they weren't successful, it probably had something to do to, with, uh, with uh, fiscal uh, fiscal not working out, uh, spending more, or not being able to take in as much as you need. The reason I'm running for the United States Senate is because we're spending, we have Republicans, and I'm a Republican, we have Republicans and Democrats alike that are authorizing, authorizing a trillion dollars deficit that you all are going to have to be sad with. Did your parents leave you with debt? Do you want them to leave you with debt? Do you want the country to leave, leave, leave you with debt that you didn't, you didn't incur? No, that's not, I don't want that either, and I don't want that for you. So that's one of the reasons why I'm running for the United States Senate. Uh, you know, when I, <clears throat> there's a couple other things. I, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes people are, are used to, you ever heard the, 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 uh, the, the saying, kicking the can down the road? <laughs> I just happened to learn that on Wednesday. I think I yeah. told you guys. Uh, yeah, kicking the can down the road. That's you know, it's it's really not being responsible for the things that you're responsible for. I played in the NFL for nine years, and um, uh, yes, I was a defensive end. I was a defensive end, and I survived in the NFL. I left on my terms. Uh, I didn't get cut. I didn't get hurt. Ninety-nine percent of people who play in the NFL either leave the game because there's someone younger, stronger, faster, and less expensive, and so they cut you to put a, a younger version of you in there, or they get hurt. 99% of players who play in the NFL get hurt. 
And so they leave one of those two ways. I didn't leave either one of those ways. I left because I had an opportunity to own Burger King restaurant. But, uh, uh, and I did that for 25 years. And uh, it was success, it was a success for me. Uh, but, uh, you know, with, with uh, the Chiefs, and I'm gonna jump around here a little bit, but with the Chiefs, you know, <coughs> I got paid a base salary. Everyone thinks professional athletes make a heck of a lot of money. I talked to Bobby Bell, who was the NFL, as the NFL Defensive Player of the Year 50 years ago. And his annual salary was $6,000 for the whole year, $6,000. Last week, he's one of the 100 best players in the, in the uh, history of the NFL. He's one of the 100 best players, and there's only 60 that are living. Uh, he's one of them. Last week, he went and shook hands for a half hour at a building downtown Kansas City, and they paid him five thousand dollars for a half hour. When he played a whole season, six thousand dollars was the end of salary. When you play in the NFL, you survive for several reasons. You survive because you perform well, right? How many people here have competed in sports? It's not. It's not. It's not easy. And, and competing is. You're doing just that. There's other someone who wants to take your job, someone that wants to beat you. Okay, that happens in the NFL. It's probably at the highest level. But there's a film up, there's a camera, just like there's a camera in here, that tells everybody how good you perform on the field. And I got paid a base salary, but I also got paid bonuses and for performing. So if I performed well, I would make more money. And that's how everyone expects to get paid nowadays, right? But in US Congress, we have elected officials that are spending a trillion dollars more than they take in every year for the last several years. Anyone have a concept of what a trillion dollars is? Oh, no, they're getting a little bit better. How much is a trillion dollars per second? Anyone have, just take a guess. All right, it's $32,000 per second. They're spending $32,000 more than they take in every second of every minute, of every hour, of every week, of every month, of every year. $32,000. One of the things that I'm proposing is, because of my business background, is that just like I got paid in the NFL for performing, I got a base salary, but I got, I got more if I did better, and I got cut if I didn't play well. I think our elected officials in Washington ought to have the same thing. <laughs> So what we are proposing, what our campaign is proposing is, for every billion, every billion dollars that we spend more in this country, every billion we spend more, every elected official in Washington, D.C. is going to get docked in their pay, their annual pay, $100. That doesn't seem a lot, $100, does it? $100 a year they get docked if they spend a billion dollars more than they take in. You know what that correlates to what they actually did last year with the trillion dollars? That would be their pay, annual pay would be docked $100,000. <laughs> they would get docked $100,000 based on if, if they would agree to that, if they would agree to that. It's nice to be with you. Uh, um, uh, I will tell you that, uh, that it is a grueling, it is a grueling task to run for political office. I encourage all of you to do it because if you, like me, care about future generations of this country, we need to do something. And you need to stand up and you need to uh, say this is not right. And, and hopefully you learn here that you have to make the, the uh, positive and negatives uh, balance. You have to balance the voice. They're not doing that in Washington, D.C. Any questions? Football questions? Economic question. Um, so, if you ran, if the Washington ran a surplus a year, would they get a hundred dollars for every billion dollars of surplus? <laughs> I, I think that would be a good way to approach it. But I, I, I doubt whether or not they'll even pass something like my proposal. But I would be willing to do that. Or what I would say is because this because this is a is serving. It's not an occupation. It's it really. If you're going to be in elected office, I would recommend that you go out and make a living. And then, just like you donate your time to a charity, that's what I would like to see more of in government. So, so maybe if they balance the budget to surplus, 
There are other governmental uh, issues that they could spend the money on, or they could give it to charity of your choice. Well, I think it, I think it's great that you've got um, some elements of competition. See how like a policy like that doesn't mean we're getting rid of government, right? We're just finding a way to bring a little element of competition, a little bit of market discipline into a governmental role. And so his proposal does that. Again, it might not be impactful if you've got multi-millionaire uh, Congress people that are like, oh, it's only going to cost me 100,000. It's more important that we run a deficit to you know, chase this program. But I think it still helps with the mentality that we've got a little bit of competition introduced into our monopoly of the government. And now when we did our quadrant system of having other people spend other people's money on people they don't know, we're starting to have them be a little bit accountable, even if it's just a tiny way of now he's spending some of his own money if they pass that deficit. So any little movement that way, I think is a positive thing uh, for our nation in terms of uh, at that top level, at the federal level. All right, any last questions? Yeah, we got a, we got some last content to get to for the end of the term Hello. here. We're on an eight week deal. I'm sorry? Burger King family owned? Well, I started it on my own. Uh, I uh, played nine, as I said, nine years, and I saved a lot of money. And uh, by the time I opened my first restaurant, all the money that I had, including the money that I brought, I was down to my last $5,000 when we opened our restaurant. But every restaurant we built allowed us, we would cash flow from the, we were doing as well as we could there, we would generate enough cash from those businesses to open up the next one and the next one and the next one. I ended up having four restaurants, 125 employees. Yeah, but it wasn't, it was family owned with my family, my wife and my two daughters, but it wasn't my parents or anything like that. We, we created this on our own. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's get a round of applause. <laughs> and debts and deficits and balancing budgets. Continue on to do a little graphs on exactly what uh, was brought up. So thank you so much. All right, so that was great. Um, so let's see here. Let's um, let's see. I think I, I did want to kind of come back to this for a little bit. So the the, the uh, chorus to the song was more bottom up or more top down. So who's the bottom up guy? Who's the bottom up guy? Is that Hayek or not? Maybe we should say, well, what, what do we mean by bottom up versus top down? What does that mean to you? Bottom up versus top down. <laughs> okay, top down would be the government, right? So kind of orchestrating. So if we think about, you know, this being uh, economic activity, maybe GDP or some other measure here, Do we have kind of a top-down approach to trying to do that, right? And so this would be from more government intervention. And so what is the bottom-up then? Who's, who's bottom-up and who's top-down? Who's bottom-up, Hayek or Keynes? Who is the bottom-up guy, Hayek or Keynes? Hayek, right? So what does bottom-up mean from that? Feeling correctly pointed out here, top down is kind of the idea that we have a strong, big, active government that helps orchestrate the economic activity through active policy. What would be a bottom up approach then? What does that mean? People. The people, yeah. So we really think about having the individual here. And the individuals, and I should have, you know, a whole population of people, right? All the regular people here, the population is now the driving force of economic activity. We push the decision making to be from the bottom up rather than from the top down. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the issues at hand. And um, part of what I talked about last night and part of what, uh, um, Dave Lindstrom or Dale Lindstrom? Not his card right here. I, have to, I just passed him in the hallway. It was kind of cool. Dave Lindstrom um, was that we don't have really good incentives in place for people of what he's trying to do. So 
when you stay in the United States Congress, you guys realize he's running to be one of those seats, right? It's a pretty big deal. How many, how many members of Congress are there? Anybody remember from your government class? I'm actually not, I'm not very good with these things either. Senate has 100. Four hundred thirty-five for the like the whole house, right? And the U.S. Senate is more limited, right? Because we just have a couple representatives from each state, and so we have equal representation in the Senate. But here's the deal: whether they're Republican, I love the way Dave said that. Whether it's Republican or Democrats, we got the same problem year after year after year in the United States government, and then we also see it around the world. It's not good to have a top-down approach. Let's keep their decisions more limited. Why? Because there's lots of evidence that says what exactly he just said. They're always going to spend more. Whatever the taxes are, they're going to spend more. Right? And so that was the message when I was on the deficit side last night. Of course, um, the deficit or government savings is equal to taxes minus government spending. If government spending is bigger than taxes, then we have negative saving or a deficit, right? So we were all kind of arguing the same thing last night. That's what I thought was kind of fun. Um, it, it is a combination of all of that stuff. And here's the evidence from around the world. We got one country, Germany, of the major uh, countries here, <laughs> uh, the ones shown anyway, that is running a surplus. But the rest of Europe, they're all running deficits. All the politicians, no matter what their political structure is, can't seem to balance their budgets in general. And again, a deficit in a given year is no big deal, but persistent deficits year after year, there's the United States, we're coming up short all the time. I think his little idea is kind of, kind of neat that um, even if we just had it part of it, I don't think that's gonna fix the problem, of course, but I, but I think it's just showing that if the people actually voted that in, that type of system, and, and Congress said it was okay, we're, we're all of a sudden, I think, changing our mentality a little bit to say, let's, let's have some incentives that are different. I bet if something like that went through, people would start looking at 10 other areas that, can we do something like that in this little area, or this department, or this, right? And all of a sudden, we start to be putting some thoughts of market influence into, into the real world. All right, questions or comments there? So that's deficits around the world. Um, bum, 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 bum. Let's see. What should I do next here? Um, let's let's talk about the tax side of the equation. Um, so it was actually brought up by Ryan last night because this is kind of a a well-known approach here on. Um, should we always raise taxes? So let's kind of put this on uh, tax collections. If you want more taxes, tax collected, should you just increase the tax rate. That's our question that we're going to try to tackle. Turns out to be a little more complicated than we think. Um, do we just have to raise the tax rate? So big T, tax revenue, tax revenue collected, if you will, is the big T that I wrote here. In our equation, C plus I plus G plus X, that's the G is off the cigarettes, and then T is that one. And if it's brought to us through an income tax, then it is little t times income. So tax revenue collected is the tax rate, little t. For example, 20% or 30% or 15% or whatever it is. The tax rate times 
our income, which is our GDP that we've been using. So if I have $20 trillion worth of income and I have a 10% tax rate, then I'm going to collect $2 trillion worth of tax revenue, right? Okay, so um, does anybody remember, I think we talked about this class or maybe in some of the common sense videos, what the highest tax rate in the United States was? 39. 39 is currently 39 and a half. What did it go up to as high as? 47. 47 higher. Higher. It was 60. In fact, I think uh, Christina in the debate last night mentioned 56, which would have been one of the old rates too. Been as high. What did you say? 70. Yeah, it's, uh, it's seven, like 74 percent was the highest marginal tax rate in the United States of America. If you made, if you were already making, remember how the marginal tax rate worked, that it's on the incremental amount of money. So back then, maybe equivalent to, let's say, $500,000. If you had already made $500,000 worth of money, which is a high income person, right? Then the next $1,000, so if you made $501,000, that extra $1,000 of income, would have been taxed at 74%. So you make a thousand, government takes 740 of it, you get 360 in your hand. Is that a very good incentive to work? No. So we kind of talked about that through the common sense stuff and through what we're doing. And that's what brings us up to this idea uh, that was part of the Reagan era in the 80s of bringing the tax rates down to approximately what we have today. Um, there was some bumping around a little bit, but uh, uh, in the 1970s, we had some of those high tax rates. Uh, Christina mentioned 56%, so those jockeyed around a little bit over time. Um, and so we thought, well, does that really create an incentive to work? And so a guy by the name of Art Laffer, Art Laffer, and the Laffer Curve. The story goes that he met with uh, Ronald Reagan. He was uh, serving on the Council of Economic Advisors for Ronald Reagan. So met with President uh, Ronald Reagan. And what he said was, you know, President Reagan, um, I think that a, a super high tax rate can cause a disincentive to work, so much so that it's possible if we decrease the tax rate, we could go up with tax collections. If we decrease the tax rate, we could go up with tax collections. And so what does that mean? Well, if we think about tax revenue here, big T, and we look at the tax rate, little t, you might think that it just goes like this. If I want more tax revenue, I increase the tax rate, right? So here I'm going from, let's say, 10%, 20%, da 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 da, da right? So I increase the tax revenue, I bring in more tax. So tax revenue again, just replicating this formula, tax rate times GDP. But what Laffer proposed or hypothesized was that that relationship looks like this. And if you're already at 74%, or maybe even Christina's 56%. If you're at this point, if you're at point A, if you cut the tax rate from 74 to 56, what happens to tax revenue? It goes up. Why? If you have the incentive to work, so you get more money. 
people have the incentive to work, they're going to go to work more and start new businesses, innovate. In other words, with this equation, if tax rate is falling, down arrow, what's happening to income? It's going up. So we're actually causing more economic activity. So we have a larger pie, so to speak, to get a fraction of our income off of. And so that can cause us to go from A to B. Well, here's the rest of that story. He did this on a napkin at a fancy restaurant in New York. And I have that napkin. This is a napkin that, or not the one that he did uh, here, but on this picture, I'll circulate it around. There's me, this is me in New York uh, in 2011, summer of 2011 when I started at OU. You might recognize him, that's Terry Haynes, he's still our university provost. The short guy in the middle is Art Laffer. And the guy to his left is Paul Volcker, who we also talked about. He was the chair of the Federal Reserve. Who's the current chair? Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell. He was the Jerome Powell back in the 80s when Laffer made this uh, uh, hypothesis. And then to the left of him is Wayne Angel. So I hold the Wayne Angel chair. He was the graduate of OU. Wayne Angel graduated from here in uh, 59, I think it was. So um, I went to this conference where these guys, we were honoring Wayne Angel at this thing, and Art Laffer was there. And I knew he was going to be there prior. So I got this like, uh, paper, kind of a higher quality paper napkin. And during a break, I went up to him and I said, listen, I, I brought kind of a, a container that I was going to hold it in because I wasn't sure. I didn't, I never talked to the guy. So I wasn't sure if he'd be up for this or not. Right. So I said, I brought the, the holder that I was going to say, and I said, you know, would you do the laughter curve on this napkin? I want to show my macro students uh, from here. And he's like, oh, yeah, come here, come here, come here, come here. He takes me into the corner where there was a stack of cloth napkins at this high-end uh, conference hall in Manhattan right across from Central Park. He just grabs one of the napkins, grabs a marker, and he wrote this down. <laughs> so what he wrote was, to Russ McCullough, this is the only curve I'll ever throw you. Our last. So that is the, the story. You guys can kind of shake it around if you need to. And, but that is the last of curve. I'll let you guys circulate it around and you can check it out. So the Laffer curve was pretty influential. And this is uh, an area of economics um, that is kind of called supply side economics. Supply side economics. Why we call it supply side is that perhaps if taxes are too onerous, then we will get a lot of activity from a tax cut rather than a tax increase. However, notice if we are on this side of the Laffer curve, and this is kind of where I would say we're probably at, I mean, I think after all that's been said and done here, if we're at 39.5% is the highest marginal tax rate for the rich is 39.5%. If we're on this side of the Laffer curve and we propose a tax cut for the rich, what happens to tax revenue? It goes down, right? So um, I think the, so let's call this point C to D. So, um, I am, I said this last night, I don't know if it came across uh, that, that much, but I definitely believe that the, the rich should pay proportionately more than the poor uh, on, in terms of income tax, if we continue to have an income tax. So that, that's called a, a progressive tax system. So that's one thing from this chapter, a progressive tax system. Did you have a question? Uh, kind of. I was just with uh, what Jacob said. How would that work if you're if you make a tax cut of what he said, ten percent would double the GDP in thirty years? Wouldn't that mean there'd be a higher tax revenue? <laughs> uh, 
if the taxes stayed the same and revenue and uh, I'm saying if, you cut, if you cut tax by ten percent, is the or is it ten percent or four percent? But it will oh. increase the GDP by or it will double the GDP in thirty years. Wouldn't that increase the tax revenue though if your GDP doubled? Yeah, but if the tax rate stayed the same, um, yeah, but you're pulling from a bigger volume. So yeah, that's right. That's this. That's this effect. Yeah, you got so it. So wouldn't that mean that if that's the case, then we're on the right side of the curve if decreasing taxes? If you decrease taxes, yeah. Um, and so I do think the the corporate. If you couldn't tell the way I jumped on Ryan once he went, he went down the wrong path when he said corporate corporate tax rates. Because I'm, I'm all about we can have higher tax rates for the rich potentially. Not this high, by the way, but you know, there's actually a, another tax bracket in here that probably could be bumped up the second tier or something. So I'm up for kind of tweak, tweaking with that, but I really do think that the corporate tax rate, we were on this side of the lever. Yeah, that's essentially right. I, I think the corporate tax rate, we were probably over here because we were at the 30, whatever it was, I can't remember, it was high 30s, like 34 to 37% was our corporate tax rate. And so I think cutting the corporate tax rate, if that keeps more businesses in the United States and also attracts foreigners to actually open up shop, you know, we're one of the best high tech places in the world. So there are foreign companies that would love to come to the United States and dip into our high tech labor pool and educate the workforce. And so we get foreign investment coming too. And so, yeah, I, I tend to think that the corporate tax rate situation is over here. Probably not so much on the uh, personal income tax side. Okay, so a progressive tax system, this means that the rich, high income, let's call them, high income people pay proportionately proportionately more than low income people. And I believe in a progressive tax system. Some people out there, some um, you know, conservatives would say, we need a flat tax. It's not fair that the rich pay more and let, let's just have an even tax of 10% across the board. So if you have a flat tax, there is kind of an element of fairness to that. If each human being that earns money uh, pays a flat amount. So I mean, that, that has some merit to it, or it has a ring of, of equality in a sense. But I don't think it makes sense when we look at the complexity of human beings and different situations that we might fall into. So how do we get the progressive thing? Let's do a quick little example of uh, similar to what we did last time. So if you make, if your income is $100,000 combined, so just to keep the numbers easy, let's make it $100,000 worth of taxable income. And the tax rate system looks like this. You pay 0% uh, for the first $40,000. 0% is your tax rate T for 40,000, zero to $40,000 worth of income. And then you pay 10% from 40 to 80,000. And then you pay 30% uh, for 80 to uh, 150,000. Okay. So I, I didn't set up my table very nicely here, but this is your income brackets, your tax brackets, but you're really measuring income. So the tax rate, 0, 10, and 30, and then depending on what income. So if you are uh, earning 35,000, do you pay any tax? If your annual income is 35,000. No, you pay zero, right? So that, that might put you in a lower income category. So how much does the person making 100,000 actually pay? 10,000, well, let's kind of let's do it. So of their income, the person making 100,000 is going to pay zero dollars here. How much on the next 40? 4,000, so we got 4,000 
for the next 40. And then we've got 30% on the last 20,000. So we got 30% on 20,000 is 6,000 bucks. And so the rich person is going to pay $10,000 on their $100,000 worth of income. Another eraser. Okay, so what does this mean then? We need to compare this to our average tax rate. So the for income of a hundred thousand dollars we have tax, uh, and let's put big T, let's call it big T, we have tax of 10,000. <laughs> so the average tax rate <laughs> is what? What is the rich person, we're calling it rich, 100,000 isn't super rich, right? But uh, what is the rich person who's making 100,000 what is their tax rate on average? 10%. 10,000 divided by 100,000. 10,000 divided by 100,000 equals 10%. The person with an income of, uh, I guess, uh, I guess let's do one more. Let's, let's say uh, 80,000. So if you're making 80,000, how much tax liability do you have? 8,000? 8, A little strong. 4, it's 4,000, right? Because the first 40, the first 40 isn't taxed. So they're going to have $4,000 of tax liability, giving them an average tax rate of 5%. <laughs> And then finally, our person making $40,000 pays how much again? Zero, which means their tax rate on average is zero. So you see, the rich are paying more proportionately than the poor are. This is our current system. This is the way our system works. There's four tax brackets, and this is the current system for the United States. So when they do tax reform, they might say, well, let's bump up this rate from 30 to 39. Right? And so then we're putting more burden on the people who are making money in this level. It's not going to go up to 39%, but it's going to creep up to maybe 13% or 15%, depending on how much we add. Does it make sense? So that's really the way the real tax system works. And it's highlighting the difference between the average tax rate and the marginal tax rate. So if I add one more column here, we are looking at marginal tax rates. The next dollar earned by the rich person, what do they pay? If you're already at 100, what's the next dollar earned going to pay? What's the next dollar that I make, the marginal dollar, extra income? I'm going to go get a part time job, I'm going to go throw pizzas or something. I'm already making 100,000. The very next dollar you make, what rate is the rate that you're gonna pay? 30%. So the marginal tax rate's 30. For the person at 80, the marginal tax rate would actually be 30 also, if they're truly exactly at 80. So using the numbers that I did here. Now if they were at 75,000, then it wouldn't be. Uh, let's look at the person who's right at 40,000. What's the tax rate for the next dollar earned for them? 10%. You see how it changes your incentives for the additional dollar that you make when we have a progressive tax system. Okay, questions or comments on that?
All right. Um, let's see here. We're going to talk about debt and deficits. Oh, we got to talk about the Social Security time bomb. I think I'm just going to show you a picture of this one. So I had a student uh, after last night's thing say, okay, uh, why is this important to me? I only have student loan debt. And so I said, are you planning to have kids someday? He said, yeah, I'm really, do you care about them? <laughs> and so that's kind of where we went there with passing the buck on to the babies, um, taxing our babies. So this is called intergenerational transfers. And here is a picture from your book again. So this is from 2014. And economists can estimate how much liability we're taking on for old people versus young people and estimate are, is the burden going to fall within the generation? So are you going to be paying what you're paying now, or are you going to get it back? What this is saying is that the money that we're spending now in Medicare and Medicaid, we are borrowing. So it's not going to be your, our generation, the current generation that's getting the help, the old people currently. Um, part of that burden is falling on a future generation their kids' kids, right? So we're kind of trying to measure that. And this is the fiscal generational imbalance. And so we've got Social Security uh, creeping up, getting some of the red with future generations, and then Medicare and Medicaid. So these are the big transfer payments um, that make up the federal tax dollars. So what was the percent of your tax dollars that go towards Robin Hood activities? What do we call Robin Hood activities? What was the three functions of government? Redistributive. redistributive function. So that's what I call Robin Hood stuff. Take from the rich, give to the poor. Take from the healthy, give to the sick. Take from the young, give to the old. Right? So here's the take from the healthy, give to the, or take from, well, this is a little bit take from the young, give to the old, but it's also take from the healthy, give to the uh, unhealthy. Take from the young, give to the old. So these are all transfer payments, right? Of your federal tax dollars that you send in, if you'd sent in $100 worth of tax, what fraction of that is going towards the redistributive function? 70 percent, approaches 70. 70 is probably the high side. So somewhere between lately anyway, it's been uh, 65, 60%. Again, that floats around depending on the obligations that they've made in terms of payments uh, versus what comes in and what goes out. Okay. So any question on that one? I just wanted to highlight that one uh, with the fiscal imbalance. Let's see. Ooh, now that the screen's down, though, maybe we should do another little video. All right, let's do this one. Okay, this one I cannot play at high speed because this guy's already a fast talker. <laughs> Good morning, it's Tuesday. I want to return to the subject of America's fascinatingly inefficient healthcare system. I want to make a capitalist argument for reform, but first, a, a brief defense of capitalism. Okay, so think of the economy as a pizza. The richest people get the largest portion of that pizza, and the poorest people get very little of it. In fact, America's fascinatingly inefficient healthcare system. I want to make a capitalist argument for reform, but first, a, a brief defense of capitalism. Okay, so think of the economy as a pizza. The richest people get the largest portion of that pizza, and the poorest people get okay. very little of it. In fact, in the Take some notes. Quit talking. I'll give you some extra credit today. Just shut up and take some notes and listen to this video. Let's call it healthcare reform. Extra credit. So take them on a piece of paper you're going to turn in. This will be extra credit today. For your final day. See how I'll take that over. Three points. I just want you to listen. What? <laughs> Ten minutes. Yeah, we'll probably do that. Okay, here we go. 
US, the poorest 40% of Americans get less than 0.3% of the pizza. That's problematic, don't get me wrong. But the cool thing about capitalism is that thanks to innovation and competition, over time, the overall size of the pizza increases. So even if your percentage slice of the pie doesn't increase, you get more pizza. This is ultimately why you probably live in a place with a refrigerator and your great grandparents probably didn't. Essentially, Hank, over time, free markets create free pizza. Well, it's not free, actually, because innovation usually means like increased use of non-renewable resources and new damage to the ecosystem. But what a free pizza! Look, and this is very important. The only way to get that free pizza is to make the world safe for innovation and competition. Like, you need innovators to create refrigerators, and then you need competition to drive the prices down. Besides creating free pizza, this also creates lots of jobs. So, yay, unfortunately, our healthcare system sucks at facilitating this. Okay, so in the United States, most people get their insurance through their employers. Like, the vast majority of companies with more than 50 employees offer health insurance plans. That's how my family and I get our health insurance through my wife's job. But if you or your spouse don't work for a big company, it can be difficult to get insurance at all because insurers can deny people access to coverage based on past health problems called pre-existing conditions. And this can lead to all kinds of rationality because people don't want to risk this pre-existing condition stuff, so they either stay at their job with a big company or they remain full-time students because those ways you're guaranteed to have health insurance. Example, in 2008, Henry Wright graduated from college and he no longer had insurance, so he figured he should enroll in graduate school in physics so he could keep his insurance, even though what he really wanted to do was do YouTube stuff. Fortunately for Henry, in that very moment, the Affordable Care Act came along, saying that he was entitled to be on his parents' insurance until he was 26. And that allowed him to go work for a tiny online video company, which in turn led to the creation of Minute Physics and Minute Earth, two of the most innovative educational projects on the internet, telling us everything from what a Higgs boson is to why locust plagues happen. Both projects have been watched hundreds of millions of times and they make us smarter, but they also increase the size of the pizza. But crazy, if it hadn't been for this weird rule in the Affordable Care Act that you get to keep your parents' insurance until you're 26, none of it would have happened. Let me give you another example. You, and by you, I mean my brother, Henry, and I don't mean the other people watching this video, although hi, you have ulcerative colitis, a chronic and very serious illness that's also extremely expensive to treat, so no insurance company will ever choose to insure you. Now, thanks to the state of Montana, you currently have a so-called catastrophic coverage plan, which caps your out-of-pocket health expenses at $10,000 per year. That's not ideal, but before Montana passed that law, you couldn't get any health insurance at all, meaning that you were constantly at risk of like a million dollar bankrupting illness or injury. So like back before this government subsidized healthcare plan came along, you had to allocate every dollar you made to the I don't want to go bankrupt if I fall off a ladder fund. But then when the state of Montana came along and forced insurance companies to at least offer catastrophic coverage to people like you, you could suddenly use your resources more efficiently. Basically, you can take all that gosh, I don't want to fall off a ladder money and start spending it on other stuff, like I don't know, DFTVA records, which now employs lots of people. Or you could spend money to start VidCon, which now also employs lots of people. Then there's the Lizzie Bennet Diaries, and Crash Course, and SciShow, and Sexplanations, and The Brain Scoop, and The Foundation to Decrease World Suck, and Subbable, and the juggernaut known as 2D Glasses. And altogether, these investments that you've made in innovation are responsible for dozens of jobs and for a significant growing of the overall size of the pizza. And none of that could have ever happened without publicly subsidized health insurance. Now, of course, I could have gone to work for a big company after college, and you could have gotten health insurance, but then there would be no nerd criteria, no big on no TFTV and records, etc. Career decisions should be about finding the place where your talents meet the world's needs, not about finding the place where you can get health insurance. Okay, so this all took a hilarious turn recently when Henry turned 26 and aged out of his parents' health care coverage. He then had to apply for his own insurance, and sure enough, he was turned down because of the pre existing conditions of tinnitus and tendinitis. That's right, he has a little bit of ringing in his ear occasionally, and his knee gets sore because he runs a lot, because he's so fracking healthy. Now, of course, on January 1st, 2014, Henry will be eligible for coverage, as everyone else will be through the Affordable Care Act. But if that didn't exist, he would be forced to choose between minute physics and his health. That is a ridiculous choice. And that ridiculous choice, as lived by tens of millions of Americans, has inhibited innovation, prevented job creation, and it has made the pizza smaller than it ought to be. Hey, there are only a few things that really piss me off in this world, and one of them is small pizzas. So that's my capitalist, fiscally conservative case for healthcare reform. For too long, we have privileged employees over entrepreneurs, when we need entrepreneurs like Henry and Hank to maximize economic growth. Hank, Thank you for being the engine that drives job growth in the American economy and for giving lots of people jobs, including me. I will see you on Friday. It's your last comment there. He's a fast talker.
so I'd like to see that you what you pulled off of that in terms of the privileging employees over entrepreneurs. Where was that part of his argument coming from? And I'm sure most of you, I wouldn't expect any of you to really have a good fix of, of health here. I'm not sure I have a good fix, frankly. It can be so confusing. I thought I got a better fix than most people, but what was he getting at? Employees kind of having a being privileged is the way he phrased it over entrepreneurs. <laughs> When, or since they couldn't afford healthcare coming right out of college, um, if you were an employee, you got those benefits. But if you went and innovated to start a new business, you wouldn't have got those benefits. With what you yeah. So um, if you have, if you're an entrepreneur, you pretty much have to get your own insurance, right? So that's one of the, the issues that are out there. If you go to join a company, so anybody that comes to OU, let's say they have a, um, you know, some sort of condition, uh, cancer, pre-cancer cell or something like that, that makes them like, oh my gosh, their health care bills could get really crazy. Maybe you don't know with perfect certainty that they're going to get crazy, but there's like a really high probability that they're going to get sick. They come to work for Ottawa University, they're just dumped into our plan. They're at it. They, they're, they're, they're not going to be excluded from uh, Ottawa University. And it's probably going to cause my rate to go up a little bit as an Ottawa employee because that high risk person is joining our pool. So my premiums could change, but if you got a big enough company, again, maybe it goes up $10 a year, $20 a year, whatever, right? So that's going to, that's kind of the pooling effect that we have for insurance. So Obama's idea was to say, let's just force everybody to be in and all the insurance rates will kind of adjust up, but everybody will be covered. And so there's, it's, a, it's a complex topic to get into, um, but there's some merits on both sides. The one that I hang my hat on is what this guy said, is that there is a, a deterrent for uh, entrepreneurship. And I believe in entrepreneurship as one of the greatest generators of income uh, for the country and wealth for the country. And so some sort of reforms um, I think would be good to get more people the freedom to go start their own job without facing uh, what I pay, I think the single, well, I'm covered 100% as part of my employment benefits at Ottawa. And then I pay for my family, so my son and my wife, uh, we pay 365 a month, just to give you an idea. And so if I went out on my own, even though we're pretty healthy, uh, that could go to $1,000 per month, like for all three of us, because it wouldn't be part of my compensation anymore. So there's an amount that OU is just covering as part of my compensation, right? And so it's a real cost that I would face of cash out of pocket. Do I go start a new business or do I stay at OU? All of a sudden, well, my insurance premiums are going to go up. But then some people think, well, I don't need insurance anyway, but now it's required by law. See how complex it's getting pretty fast? And so it's not an easy thing to cut, um, to, to set straight. And then there's other issues with rising healthcare because uh, doctors and insurance companies don't really have incentive to watch the bottom line. You as a consumer, if you're getting 80% of the bill covered and you only have to pay 20% up to your deductible or something, you don't have an incentive to shop around the doctors well, this doctor charges $15,000 for a knee surgery. This doctor charges $20,000. Do you guys shop around to see who can give you the best deal on knee surgery? No, because by the time you get up to that level, your maximum out of pocket is it's all 100% covered. So you have no incentive to create competition in the healthcare industry. And so when there's no competition and it starts to look like uh, you know heading towards monopoly, it's not monopolized at this point, unless we let the government run the whole dang system, which would not be a good thing to do either uh, for a variety of reasons I don't have time to get into. But if we don't, if we lack competition, what happens to prices? They go up, right? And that's what we've seen in the healthcare industry. It has outstripped uh, inflation of other industries uh, by a long shot. Another industry that uh, has been outstripped, by the way, is education. Is the government involved in education? Yeah, in a big way. So we see when we don't have those competitive forces like 
our uh, senator candidate, uh, uh, Dave. Dave. Dave Lindstrom, our Kansas City guy, he wants to bring in some of that competition into the government sector. That can help move uh, move the needle the right direction, start moving the ball, I guess we should, but uh, we can use a football analogy with them, moving the ball the right direction. Um, if we have senators like uh, him that think that way. All right, questions or comments, Sam, on the rest of the video? All right, so healthcare is messed up, basically. Bottom line is a takeaway. You have a few things in your in your chapter. Up. There's some comments on healthcare. So we'll talk about that. So let's look at um, government budget. <coughs> what I want to do is create a graph that puts. Real GDP on the horizontal axis. This is something you'll see in your homework and test. You want this to go on a left and turn data? No, this is back to your regular notes. Yeah, just, just that video will be the turn in. I, I have another video planned too, so we'll have another thing to add on. So keep that separate. This is back to your regular notes you're keeping. So real GDP. Income of the nation, quantity of beer, quantity of chicken wings, quantity of lawyer services, quantity of haircuts, right? So when we see that word real, we're thinking quantities. And up here, we're just going to measure dollars. And I want to create a government spending function and a government tax revenue function. So as income goes up, what would likely happen to the amount of ta holding tax rates constant? If we have income for the nation going up, what happens to tax revenue? It increases, right? So that would be, let's say, a line that looks like this. So this is tax revenue. Your book, remember we called this, when we did this earlier, more generally called tax receipts or receipts of the government. So it's money coming into the government. And then as we make more income, what would be happening to government spending? Increasing or decreasing? So let's kind of pick apart some of the programs. Some of the things we talked about was welfare and food stamps, right? Take from the rich, give to the poor. So if the nation is becoming more prosperous, are there more people on food stamps or less? less, right? So is there more people on welfare or less? Less. Less. All of a sudden they're finding jobs, right? So we have unemployment rates that are low and people are like, oh, I was uh, poor, didn't have a job, but now I have a job. So I don't, I can go off welfare. I can go off food stamps. I can go off what we call needs-based spending. So let's make a little note here. Needs-based <coughs> government spending. So this is government spending that is dependent upon people in need. So who's that? So we could have the unemployed. So we have unemployment uh, insurance. So people are getting a check for unemployment insurance. We've got food stamps. Welfare recipients. So it's basically any government program that's really, uh, I guess, kind of more or less designed to be the social safety net in a sense, right? So these are kind of uh, social safety net um, things. If the government optimally has determined, which is a long shot given rational ignorance, that we have 10 stealth bombers, 
And 10 stealth bombers is sufficient to protect our nation and guard us against the bad guys. And girls, the bad girls, the bad people, okay? So we have 10 stealth bombers. If we're rich, if we're rich, would we need to buy more stealth bombers? No, right? Just because we're rich doesn't mean we have to increase weapons of mass destruction. See where I was going with that? So on the flip side, if we've determined that 10 stealth bombers is the optimal quantity of weapons of mass destruction to protect our nation, and the economy falls into recession, should we sell off some of those stealth bombers? No, not if they're the right amount. Like we're, we're kind of saying as a nation, this is what we need to protect the nation. We kind of determine that through some sort of process. My point in saying that is that that type of spending is not dependent upon income, even though in some cases we can stretch that it is. But for the most part, we've made that determination without that. So if those stay fixed and this goes down, then the government spending function looks like this. Government spending, G, big G, this is big T up here. So your book again calls this outlays. As we become more prosperous with income, there's less welfare, less food stamps, less unemployed. There's no reason to think we're buying more self bombers. So government spending is actually going down when we have the nation humming along at full employment and hitting our potential level of GDP. Okay, so now, of course, all the fun stuff in economics happens where the two lines cross. What's happening at the two lines crossing here? Equilibrium, a fun kind. We're going to put a little more meat on the bones on that. What kind of equilibrium? We got tax revenue equaling government spending. So what would you call this point here? A balanced budget, good. So the budget is balanced. So that was my argument made last night as my way to save the nation's woes is that at least over a period of time, we should end up having these two things equalized. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be a big fan of, uh, of having it be forced to be balanced every year uh, because from year to year, we might have some things happen where we might need to run a deficit or we might need to run a surplus. All right, so this is the level of real GDP that balances the budget. Let's call it YBB, the balanced budget. So balanced, balanced budget, if we hear about a balanced budget amendment, that implies that T equals G. We did what Dave, uh, the politician here, our proposed US Senator was talking about doing. We don't spend more money than we made, right? Like he ran his Burger King business. We don't go into run a deficit that year and add on to company debt, but rather let's just manage from what we have. Well, that's what it would be at the government level. Okay, so now when this happens, if the economy falls into a recession, let's call it Y1. Uh, so the economy falls down. Remember uh, our picture from a while back where if we're measuring time and real GDP, ups and downs of the economy over time, we're going like this, right? So the ups and downs, what do we call the downtime from if it lasted at least six months? A recession, so that was the recession. So income is falling from YBB to Y1, right? So this picture is kind of like this happening here, YBB to Y1. What's gonna happen now in terms of the government's budget? They're going to spend more or less money, more, they're going 
going to spend more money. We go up to the government spending function, and there's G1. And then what about taxes? They're going to be less because there's less income, right? So less money to be taxed. So taxes are over here at T1. And so what's this? What's that vertical height? That's the deficit, right? Government spending is greater than our tax revenue. And so this is called our deficit. Take good notes and draw a good graph. This will be on your final. I will promise you that. So what if income ended up swinging out and we have an expansion to Y2? <laughs> so at Y2, we've had the economy's humming along, unemployment is down. Well, the government <laughs> spending is going to be less. It's going to be T, uh, G, sorry, the T. I'm on the government spending line. So we go up to the government spending line, hang a left, and that's going to be G2. At this high level of income, the economy's doing great. The government's brought in a lot of taxes, so they're at T2. And what do we call this vertical distance? Surplus. Surplus, which we don't see. We almost don't know what that is in the United States, but that is a government surplus where we've actually collected taxes in excess of government spending. So what I proposed last night was that in a functioning economy, we could be going back and forth. If politicians plan to have a balanced budget around the potential for the economy, so if this was equal to Y pot, remember Y pot from a while back? We weren't smoking pot, no marijuana here, but this was the potential for the economy. That was this, our potential for the economy, our long run potential. If we were operating at our potential, then we should be there. But we're not going to be at our potential always, every year, right on the money. Sometimes things may have it such that we're in excess of our potential, which would cause a surplus. And then sometimes we might have a deficit if coronavirus was unexpected and all of a sudden that had a negative impact on the economy. Then we might have to run a deficit for a period of time. But over a period of last night, I said eight years. By the way, I just totally made that up on the fly. I, I didn't put much thought into it. I was going to say five years. I'm like, ah, five years doesn't seem right enough. Let's make it an even number, and I jacked it up to eight. I didn't want it to be ten. So I was hoping to make it narrow enough. But I just kind of made that up as I went right on the fly. But over time, these things are equalizing each other is what I had said my proposal would be, that surpluses equal deficits over some period of time. So I called it a floating balanced budget. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so now let's look at the case in the United States. So here, draw a new graph. And you can go ahead and draw your T line and your G line. And if you want, you can call this, of course, the where the balanced budget would be. So YBB is at the balanced budget. How long have we been basically running a deficit for in the United States? 50 years, right? With the exception of a couple little surpluses in there. 40 to 50 years, back to the 1970s. And so clearly, our potential for the economy is not lining up with where there would be a balanced budget. Instead, 
we apparently are here at yp, that's the pot. And so at this level of real GDP, we are running a deficit, right? So let's call it G pot and T pot. Ooh, that's kind of fun. I've never done it that way with pot. I usually just have the T, but since you guys wanted to talk about marijuana, I'll use pot. Okay, so with the, the economy is like actually in really good shape. So would the government spending be the problem then in this example? Because like you said, unemployment's at like a all time low or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So wouldn't it be government spending the problem then? Yeah. So Bryce's question is, is when, and, and we'll play out the model, if, if we're actually at this level and government uh, tax collections are um, at whatever they are, is it a spending problem? That is the thing, that we're spending too much. I'd say probably. I think spending, last night I would say spending is probably, I say persistent deficits, but where does that come from? Because no matter what we raise tax rates at, Politicians are going to spend more than that, right? But it's just, it's a moving target. We go, oh, we got a balanced budget problem. Let's raise tax rates, like Ryan was uh, arguing. We all, by the way, just split up arguments, so it's not like we were coming from angles that were super heartfelt. But um, let's raise tax rates. Government's going to spend that, not take the surplus and save it and pay down the debtors. So I think, in general, it is a spending problem in general that has to do with. <laughs> The deficit that's persistent is there because of the lack of incentives in place for politicians to put money in the right place. So back to this picture though. So this deficit, even if we're right on the money, we're still running a deficit is the point, right? Even if we're right operating at where the economy should be in the long run, we're still running a deficit. If we've been doing it for 50 years, we're not swinging back and forth. We clearly have what is called a structural deficit. It's structural in the sense that even when we are where we should be, the structure of our government is set up that government spending is higher than taxes. So we're going to have that persistent deficit, a structural deficit. The deficit can get bigger though. So now if we float from Y pot to Y1, let me I'll do my same color coding here. So now if we go into recession, the deficit gets bigger. We have G1 and T1. <coughs> and now we have added to the structural deficit, what we call a cyclical deficit. So the green chunks here is the cyclical deficit. The cyclical deficit. If we were to swing this way, we'd still have part of our structural deficit, right? I'm not gonna even draw that one, but um, if we come this way, well, we can draw part of it, I guess, um, just to make sure it does work this way, of course, too. If the economy does good, we still end up having a deficit at Y2. And we actually kind of have a cyclical surplus, surplus that's offsetting some of our structural deficit, but we're still in deficit. Make sense? Questions? All right, let's get to our last video here that you can take some notes on. This one is calling debt and deficit. My name is Paul Antonio. 
and ask us to listen to the United States of America. Good morning, Andrew Tuesday. So one of the biggest issues in global politics these days is government debt and deficits, which is a particularly big deal in the United States because of the presidential campaign and also because of the looming fiscal cliff. Oh, and Hank, as you'll no doubt remember, I received a bronze medal in economics at the 1994 Alabama State Academic Decathlon, meaning that in 1994, I was the third best 17-year-old economist of debt and deficits, which is a particularly big deal in the United States because of the presidential campaign and also because of the looming fiscal cliff. And Hank, as you'll no doubt remember, I received a bronze medal in economics at the 1994 Alabama State Academic Decathlon, meaning that in 1994, I was the third best 17-year-old economist among all C students in the state of Alabama. So not to brag or anything, but I'm pretty qualified to explain this stuff. Okay, so first we have to separate the ideas of debt and deficit. Debt is the total amount of our outstanding liability. Deficit or occasional surplus is the difference between what the government spends and what it takes in. Right, so in the United States, our current national debt is around $16 trillion, which sounds like a lot of money, and, and it is. So let's break this down. The largest single holder of U.S. government debt is actually the federal government itself, because trust funds like Social Security buy government bonds, and so the interest goes from the U.S. government to a different part of the U.S. government, which is not borrowing as we usually imagine it. So if you take away that money, you're left with about $11 trillion, which is still a fair bit of cash. Who owns that debt? China, you probably guessed. But in fact, no. The plurality of that debt is actually owned by us, us being American individuals and institutions. China owns about 8% of our debt, Japan 7%, and the U.K. 1%. But it's important to note that the U.S. also owns foreign debt, including about $235 billion of sovereign debt in China and Hong Kong. Altogether, for every $1 of of U.S. debt that's owned by a foreign country, we own about 89 cents of foreign debt. So you can't really think of government debt the same way you think about like a family owing money to a credit card company, because in that situation, the family owes money to someone else. But in the case of U.S. government debt, we mostly indirectly or directly owe money to ourselves. So our national debt is a very large number, but at least at the moment, it is not a very large problem. Like in 2011, we paid about 3% total interest on our debt. In 2012, it will be even less because our debt is incredibly cheap right now. I mean, heck, in some ways, it is literally cheaper than three. Right now, the yield on a one-year treasury bond is 0.17%. Okay, two very important things to know about. First, China can't, like, call in our debt on a day of its choosing. If I buy a $100 one-year treasury bond today, I'm going to get that $100 back along with my 17 cents in interest in one year. I can't call after a month and be like, give me my money back. So despite what you hear from a lot of political commentators, that is not really a risk to the U.S. economy. Secondly, you may have heard people say the government should be run like a business. It should never spend more than it takes in. Yeah, no, that is not how businesses are run. Like, say that tomorrow I invent a Marty McFly hovercraft skateboard. In that situation, I wouldn't wait 20 years until I'd sold enough DFTBA posters to build my Marty McFly hoverboard factory, I would just borrow the money and build the factory immediately so I could start selling hoverboards and swim in a sea of $100 bills. Actually, I would not swim in a sea of $100 bills. I would hoverboard over that sea. Businesses spend more than they bring in all the time, as well they should, and almost all economists agree that governments are similar. There are times when they need to run deficits. For instance, during a recession, government revenue goes down because wages stagnate and unemployment goes up, but government expenditures have to go up, like on unemployment benefits, for instance. So just to be clear, deficits are not inherently evil, and our current debt, while it is very large, does not pose a threat to the American economy because we can pay it back with relative ease. I mean, it's not going to be free, but it's going to be like 2% of GDP. We've done it before. However, there is a huge future risk to us, because what if our debt stopped being cheap? What if people stop believing that the U.S. is the safest place to put their money and they start to buy bonds in, I don't know, like Brazil or China or Germany? Well, that would be very bad, because most years we run a budget deficit, and so we would need to keep borrowing money at these higher interest rates, which would necessitate more deficits and therefore more borrowing at progressively higher interest rates. And then we'd have to cut spending, which would slow growth, and raise taxes, which would slow growth more, and then Greece. Except this might actually be much worse for us than it's been for Greece, because the U.S. enjoys all kinds of benefits from having the world's most trusted currency. Like, hey, believe it or not, most U.S. paper currency actually circulates outside the U.S., and that's very helpful for us in terms of exchange rates and keeping our debt cheap. And if we lost that, it would be devastating, because we would just be a regular country again. Okay, so the federal deficit in 2000 
housing revenue was about 1.3 trillion. It'll be down a little bit this year to about a trillion. It'll be down further in 2013, no matter who is president, to about 900 billion. But most people think that number needs to continue to come down, or at some point we are going to risk these spiraling higher interest rates. So there are two ways of doing this. The first is to print more money, like, oh, we need 100 billion dollars to close the deficit. Look, I just made 100 billion dollars using a printing press. That sounds like a fine idea, except that it will lead to inflation. Now, a lot of people in Congress will be saying that we should just return to the gold standard, which I think is a very bad idea for the reasons I explained in the doodle do. However, in the broadest sense, our currency is already pegged to goods and services because if the amount of money in the world doubled tomorrow, the amount of stuff wouldn't. So you can imagine what would happen to the cost of everything. It would double. The second and better way to cut the deficit is to close the gap between what we take in and what we spend. And in terms of economic expansion, this is actually quite easy because the tax base grows and the amount of money people make goes up, so they pay more taxes, so we can just have surpluses as we did in the 1990s. But during slow recoveries, like the one we have right now, it is much more complicated. So like both President Obama and Governor Romney favored unspecified spending cuts, Governor Romney also favors a tax cut of 20% across the board, whereas President Obama thinks that we should increase taxes by rolling back the bush era tax cut on income over $250,000. Neither of these plans is likely to eliminate the deficit, although again, the deficit doesn't necessarily need to be eliminated. And no matter what political rhetoric you hear, neither of these plans is terribly radical either. President Obama wants to put the top marginal income tax rate at 39%. It was over 50% every year from 1945 until 1986. Mitt Romney wants to cut that tax rate to 28.5%, which is where it was in 1989. We can argue thoughtfully about what our policy position should be, but amid all the rhetoric and decontextualized statistics, I just want to underscore that while deficit reduction is important, it is not a crisis. The whole idea here is to keep it from becoming a crisis, and one of the best ways to do that is to understand the problem without yelling about it, to discuss things honestly without assuming that the people who disagree with you hate America. Thank you. I'll see you on the phone. P.S. Friendly. All right. So there's your final rally there. So if the debt continues to climb, is the U.S. starting to look more risky potentially? Yeah. That's where if the risk goes up, the rate goes up, the spending goes up, and it could get ugly. So, all right, we're all set. Start your projects due Friday at 5 p.m. So start your projects. Much about the income, but get, so right now we're definitely operating at about 
So this year, instead of Trump's proposal of running a million dollars or trillion dollar deficit, we probably ought to be running a budget down the road. Roughly, conceptually. So I thought the government spending still a trillion dollars, even though the economy is doing better, so it's better. Is it better than would this be an unrealistic model for what we are right now? Right. What we have right now is broken. In we need to get to a balanced budget. But even if we should, what this is saying is we should be running closer to a balanced budget right now with the hot economy that we have. We should be in that. So we obviously have a structural deficit. Ah, uh, okay, so you guys are the baseball crew, uh, but you're back on Tuesday? No, we're on Sunday. Oh, you're on last Monday. I thought you meant this coming Monday, because this coming Monday is the test. Um, Monday, 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 Monday. I don't think we've had any class class, so I think you're fine. Uh, if you see something pop up, I, I'm pretty sure we did not have any class points on Monday. So I think you guys are clear. Just make sure you stay up with your projects and all. We've got a lot of due dates now. And then we will have class on uh, Friday. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep. All right. Who's next? <laughs> ah, you were that person. All right. Did you put it on there? Put your name on there now. Oh wait, I am in my system here. I'm not broken. Um. Yeah. What's? I looked at. I I literally checked it once. What's the one with an hour? No, it was not an hour. Kate is the one that turned it on. What's your last name? So it was technically both. No, only thinks it's not her because she did anything else. And she didn't because I hope it was Alright, which one was that? So, um, the one I did turn on. Everything was on both of us. So, Uh, 
Uh, macroeconomics. Fun stuff. No. Take it. Yeah.